What's good, people? It's your boy Icarus Gray, and our new waifu is for the streets. <laughs> episode two was interesting, to say the least. So at the start of the episode, we get more rage shield exhaustion recap, and then we go into the intro, which it it's it slaps. All shield hero intros slap, but the the first OST is is the best. We're just gonna yeah. Keep it a thousand. Now we're into the first new content of episode two, which is the War Council. We get to meet a lot of the other dignitaries of the different nations around Melromark. We don't get any names because I don't really think it's all that important, but we get a bit more explanation of what this world is and a bit more expansion. And I was very appreciative of that. It strikes me as odd that the spirit tortoise only attacks densely populated areas. It leads to a lot of different speculations that I have about the world and kind of how it functions in terms of its cyclical nature. The people here once again get into a thing of not needing the cardinal heroes. And the way they stand on these premises is kind of like political leaders basically backing their political party or their political summoned hero. It's strange how they interact in a way of like our natural world, not really wanting to help one another or understanding that we should probably come together to stop this menace. It's rooted in self-interest based on what, uh, like any political party or delegate or dignitary, uh, what would be most beneficial to their constituents, their kingdom, their mindset, what's going to help them the most. Makes sense. Now Fumi now steps up to be the voice of reason, but for the first time, I actually don't agree with his assessment of the situation. A lot of these people are speaking for their nations being hurt, wanting to get revenge, wanting to get at that person, which is a very human thing. It's hard to relinquish anger when you're the person that's supposed to protect your people. Now Fumi has a lack of understanding here. He's still jaded by how he feels about all of the other things that have happened to him, even though he's kind of on the other side of it at this point. And that goes back to his initial interaction with the king of Melromark, as well as the formerly known Princess Mine, and their selfish interactions, as well as his interactions with the cardinal heroes. Uh, the author does a great job of challenging our own assumptions along with Naofumi's, because like Naofumi, we believe that majority of these delegates are out for themselves. That was a very nuanced ad that the author did as well that I think even emboldens that more just because you're starting to kind of see that this world is a lot bigger than, well, most isekais to me. Now we have a quick break from the War Council to have Eclair and Granny is what I'm going to call her because her name is so difficult for me to say. They enter the fray to come and help now Fumi with the war planning, which he isn't currently back from. And there's this cute moment with Philo where she's jealous of the fact that Ralph Talia gets to be with him in this war council. The most pivotal moment of this episode for me is learning about the seven star heroes. Learning that the greater world is more than just the cardinal heroes that we're used to, that there are more people who are not only summoned, but some that are chosen to do different jobs. It was also kind of shocking, but not so shocking to learn with the plot armor that is the fact that now Fumi is our main character, that the queen thinks that a lot of these seven star heroes, well, if not all of them are weaker than now Fumi currently is now. It adds a level of depth to the world that kind of makes his job even more important in how he moves and how he thinks, because it seems to be something that is so crucial to getting to where he is. Now we have our shrouded waifu enter, who turns out to be Osh Horai, the, well, it seems like she's one of the seven star heroes, but she's actually a familiar of the spirit tortoise. It, it, I didn't see it coming, but my producer did. And I feel kind of, take my anime card. Green eyes, man, green eyes. Good point. With Os entering the fray, she now explains what the spirit tortoise is all about. It's meant to stop the waves. 
and technically wasn't even supposed to awaken right about now. Blocking the waves and gathering souls, it's his sole purpose in life. I see what I did there. Hmm. Hmm. Wordplay. We see that the basic system that the spirit tortoise runs off of is his familiars and his beasts go out to secure souls for him. And if they can't do that, then well, he does it himself. But the issue with what's going on now is he's currently way off his cycle because there's a lot more time that's supposed to be between him waking up and acting at all. My presumption here, probably rightly so, is that whoever our new antagonist is, is controlling the spirit tortoise for selfish reasons or some deluded sense of justice. Now Fumi ponders Vittoria's words once more to thinking that this is what she meant when talking about sacrificing lives and what it actually meant to stop the waves. He thinks about the fact that he doesn't want to sacrifice anyone, especially not masses of people from any world, let alone his own. It's at this point that I was feeling like Ost can't be that helpful. I mean, but I also feel like she's playing the rabbit when she's actually the fox. I think that there's more to her and she's most likely gonna be controlled by with the antagonist and now Fumi is of course gonna save her in what is the most humble harem that I've seen in anime. While it seems like a lot of the dictators are acting like the cardinal heroes in terms of their concerns and wishes, they actually care about their people. And that's kind of what I got towards the end of this meeting and the end of this information gathering as they decide to kind of all work together. Now Fumi's current plight though is that he wants to protect his people first. I don't think that he's necessarily wrong, but I also think that he's kind of becoming a bit like the other Cardinal heroes as in his scope is kind of small. You came here to protect the world and you made that decision when you didn't take out Glass, Lark, and Teresa. So continue being that. We get our first look at the antagonist, but there's no eye contact or anything like that. I think we just get pretty much like half-faced hair color or something like that. Um, but if you watch the intro, you're gonna see him anyway because I always do a bit of intro dissection in all of the animes that I watch. Ost introduces herself to the party and we get a bit of backstory on everyone because of it. I like the way they used her to give us backstory on characters that we haven't really seen or characters that we never got their name before in terms of Eclair and Granny who's again, I can't say her name, not even gonna try, just gonna call her Granny. I appreciate at this point that Eclair explains why she's there. Realizing that Eclair is the daughter of the former Lord of Sylvanette was something that was really cool and important to the development of this character and why she's there. It brings us even more connection to the fact that a lot of people were hurt by the actions caused by the Lord after her dad and she wants to atone for that. And that's another endearing thing that they're presenting to us with this character. Rattalia comes to correct Naofumi and refocus him on the fact that he's here to protect everyone. And she knows that that's what's in his heart and that they should probably try and formulate a plan with everyone and he doesn't have to try and shoulder everything by himself. That was the whole reason he brought them around to trust him. The new plan is group together and make it follow us, which is actually pretty amazing. And why I think that the spirit tortoise as a vehicle for whatever the antagonist is doing, the simplicity in what he'll follow makes it very easy to form strategies, which gives us a really good developed plot. It's also here that we get the names of each of the nations that are currently helping. We get Haikazuya, which is providing the Dragon Riders as decoys, Lowry Rot to take out the legs, Midius to provide the mages to take down the old abandoned fortress from an old war, and then now Fumi is gonna, you know, do what he does, and they're gonna try and take off his head because the spirit tortoise functions like any other monster. Take off his head, it's done. There's an interaction that now Fumi has with Risha at this point where they're going over the plan where I think he's acting a bit like Ishiki. He's overly protective of her in a way that I didn't expect him to be at this point, given that I thought he trusted her a bit more. 
we get a preparation montage and Elhart, which I think is the name of the blacksmith, sends new equipment. We got so much in this episode that was not available in the season. We didn't know the name of the old lady. We didn't know the name of the blacksmith. Claire was introduced on the last episode and we didn't even get her name. So we're getting a lot of exposition in really cool ways that you just have to kind of sift through to pick up. The best thing is Risha in her Fatoria suit. Quay, Quay. Ose is the comic relief for this episode as she calls Risha out for the fact that she does love Ishiki, which is pretty obvious and tells her, you know, just sleep with him. Consent, everybody, I, I just consent. It even further emphasizes the fact that Ralph Talia is as green as it comes and has no idea what anything is. She does not know what sex is and it's, I mean, it's funny, it's cute, it, it's endearing to her character. And I like how they're doing this this season with showing just how out of touch she is with things that are normal for her that are not normal for others. The episode quickly ends on the Spirit Tortoise Awakening, which I wasn't expecting another abrupt ending because I haven't felt as satisfied currently with just the way the exposition has been compared to season one. Overall though, I can't wait for episode three. Now that you know what episode two is about, it's only right that you keep up with the series. And to do that, you're gonna wanna click this video here so that way you can stay informed with everything that's going on with the Shield Hero this season. If you watched the episode, make sure you leave your comments down below on what you thought about it, what are your expectations for episode three and further, because I'd love to hear what your thoughts are alongside mine as we discuss this amazing anime that we enjoy watching. If this recap helped you in any way, hit the like, hit the subscribe and hit the bell so you can be notified for every time that we do a video over here at Gray Area Anime. Until next time, peace.